Heavenly Father, we come to you this Sabbath morning seeking your presence. Reveal yourself through your Holy Spirit. Show us Jesus. We bring only our need. We confess our sin. And Lord, may you find our worship to be a blessing. We ask and pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 531, hymn number 531. We'll build on the rock. Let's stand as we worship in song number 531. everybody a happy sabbath welcome to the mountain view seventh day adventist church we're gonna feast on the word of god and then we've got potluck immediately after and you're invited amen thank you today's local um church budget is okay before passing the offering plates and expecting everyone to put money, let's go bigger. Instead of money, let's give what God really wants, ourselves. Amen. Money makes a great offering, but the best offering is to give yourself to God. Today, I ask everyone to participate by giving not just money, but yourself to God. Today's loose offering is for our local church budget. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day which you have given us. Thank you for your love. Help us not to give only what um, our money, but what you really want ourselves, and that we would remember that you own everything, the cattle on a thousand hills, the whole earth, and that 
we need to give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 for the children's story. Hello. Very good. Thank you. I am. How y'all doing? It's good to see you. It's good to see adventurers up there with the Pathfinders and appreciate the young people's involvement, the, the homes that they represent, where service comes at an early age. Praise the Lord. 
Raise them up and they won't forget it. Amen. I'm going to tell you a story that's a little bit gruesome. You know what gruesome is? It's like when somebody gets hurt. Okay, they get hurt kind of bad. Anyway, it's got a it's got a good ending. Okay, but it's a little gruesome. Man's name was Gary. Gary was a young man. He was in his late teens, early twenties, and he was in college and he played baseball. And Gary was an all-American baseball player. You know what that means? It means he was the best of the best. Okay? And that he was going to get drafted by a professional baseball team and he was going to play baseball and he was probably going to get his face and his statistics on a baseball card and little boys would go buy bubble gum and baseball cards and they'd know all about Gary and Gary was going to be famous and Gary was probably going to make a lot of money. <coughs> Gary grew up on a farm. Gary played baseball and Grew up on a farm, and what it, at farms, you know, they got animals, and they got tractors, and they got crops. And the Bible tells us there's seed time, and there's what? Harvest. That's right. Thank you very much. And harvest. And it was time to harvest the alfalfa. And when you cut alfalfa, you're basically cutting grass, fancy grass, important grass, but grass. They used big grass cutters, and Gary was driving the tractor, cutting alfalfa, and nobody's quite sure what happened. But when Gary woke up, his family was standing over him, and he had fallen off of the tractor and into the mower, and both of his legs had been removed. Nobody knows exactly how it happened. But when Gary woke up, his legs had been cut off. Well, his family was very quick, and tourniquets were applied, and the emergency vehicles were, were called in EMS, and Gary lived. He didn't die. He could have bled to death very quickly, but he didn't. They were heads up. It's important when you live in the country that you've got a plan, amen? Because you never know. But one thing was certain. Gary didn't have his legs anymore. Now some people would say, well, life's kind of empty. You've got legs, you can't run. But you know, he lost his legs, but he st there were a whole lot that had been left. Amen? And Gary didn't go on to play baseball. Instead, Gary went on to law school, and he became a lawyer, and he decided he wanted to work with young people, and so he ended up becoming a juvenile lawyer, and instead of a baseball card, he ended up impacting many, many, many families, families with significant needs, okay? And so some people would have lost their legs and life would have been over and they weren't going to play baseball and they would have become bitter and nothing would have necessarily come of their life. But Gary chose a different course. He chose to use what the good Lord left him and to do the most he could with it. And he ended up, instead of becoming a, a baseball card for little boys and little girls, he became someone who worked with parents and children and made a difference in many, many lives. So you may be faced with some challenges at some point in your life, and we hope it doesn't involve losing your legs or an arm or anything like that, right? But sometimes challenges come in the way of differences of opinion, yeah? Or a brother or a sister, you know? Or I had it first, right? That kind of thing. You guys ever run into that at your house? You know, we had four little grandchildren at our house this last week. And I tell you what, I had it first is one of those little things that mommy and daddy with grandpa and grandma's help 
are still working on, okay? And so we want to we wanna remember that Jesus wants us to, to be charitable and to do the best with what he's given us. Amen? Now, will you kneel with me? And we're going we're gonna to say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for these youngsters, Lord, and their involvement in the service today. Lord, the, ad, the little adventurers and the big pathfinders. And just, Lord, bless each home represented um, in a mighty way. Lord, we ask that you would be with us through the remainder of this service. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Fear not, fear not, stand still, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. Chapter 14, verse 13, from the book of Exodus. Fear not, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. today and please be with the pastor please please um please help him to please help him to speak with with God's Holy Spirit please help him to be bold and we thank you for a beautiful weather today and please be with the sick people or the people who are not here today, and please be with them. And please be with all of us. Thank you for your blessings. Forgive us all for our sins. Please write our names in the book of life. Thank you for this beautiful day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Our scripture reading today is 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they, were, they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Amen. Yeah, since since you spoke, Brother Nesbitt, um, there's a Jones, a Nesbitt, a Haddock. And a Ross in the church today. And some of you don't understand that that's a kind of a significant deal, but it is. Um, so, welcome to everybody. All right. Um, yeah, you know, I think that if anything, one, we were blessed by the reading of the word amen. amen. And we got a little bit of a picture into what it must be like to be Alan's parents. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord and, pr and keep them in prayer. Amen. All right. The um, title of today's sermon, and you know, here's the thing, you know, you'd like to be able to say, oh, I was covered up and busy and oh, you know, the reality is, is I think I was distracted and poorly organized this week and I'm just going to own that. I hope that you still love me. You know, we're supposed to be able to, what, confess our shortcomings and our faults and, and then we bear one another's burdens, amen. Um, the title of today's sermon is Stepping Stone or Stumbling Block. Um, the two things, it's going to deal with some life situations. It's also going to deal with you. And the question is, is are you a stepping stone or a stumbling block? Um, and so we're going we're gonna to address that. I also, before we step off into that sermon... Um, I want to I wanna just do a little mini sermon here. This is for Sister Dina. Um, yeah, I called you by name, blew your cover. Um, because a while back we studied, we were studying the first fruits. Remember in Sabbath school? And there was some discussion about what are first fruits. And, and I, I don't know that I have all the answers or have the time for a comprehensive answer at this time. But what I do want to do is to, um, is to kind of do a little visual thing here and, and maybe a springboard for uh, further study on your part. 
you'll recall that in Leviticus 23, there is a, a list of the feasts and the fast of the Lord for the children of Israel. Those are a type of Christ's ministry on our behalf. Amen? And we, we understand that this Levitical gospel is part of the sanctuary message and the entire Jewish economy, which points us to the Messiah, who we understand, believe, and know to be Jesus of Nazareth. Um, you can read more about the first fruits or the wave sheaf in Leviticus 23, 1 Corinthians 15. But I want to also look at Matthew 27, 52 and 53, just very quickly. Um, Matthew, 5, Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53. Um, and it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now, that little text in Matthew is kind of the focus of what's about to follow. I want you to put yourself in the place of the Israelite in, at the time preceding Jesus or at the time of Jesus. And you've been called to Jerusalem. There's three feasts a year in which the males of, and their families of the, of the Israelites have to go to Jerusalem. And the Passover is one of those. And so as the children of Israel are making their way to Jerusalem, this great body of people, they're walking towards Jerusalem, and they see in the fields the barley as it's starting to ripen, and they see that part of the barley has been marked and is, has been designated as that offering of the first fruits. Okay? Now, the grain is ripening, and they're going to they're going to celebrate the Passover. There'll be the Passover. There'll be the feast of unleavened bread, and then the at the two days after the Passover, okay, which is going to fall on a Friday. The Passover is going to fall on a Friday. All right, Jesus is going to die. Jesus is my Passover. All right, his body's not going to corrupt in the grave. Amen. He's going to rest on the Sabbath day in the grave. All right. Unleavened bread, okay, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the wave sheaf is presented, or the offering of the first fruits. Now, the interesting thing about that offering of the first fruits, anybody got daffodils blooming? I want you to think of daffodils as first fruits. Daffodils are blooming, and they are the promise of a much larger bloom. Amen? See what I'm saying? So when we see those, it's like, oh, wow, look. You know, my dogwood's going to bloom, my red bud, my quince, my whatever it may be. And so as they're traveling and they see this, these first fruits, it's a promise of a greater harvest. Amen? You with me? All right, simple enough. You know, God is so good. He makes it, even I can understand it. All right? Now, the first fruits are waved, and it's, a, it's not a single barley head. It's a small sheaf. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, is that the barley, is the, the wave sheaf offering, is never burned but is rather that the burnt offering is a lamb. And why is it that that wave sheaf isn't burned? Because it represents glorified bodies and uncorruptible beings who have been resurrected and taken to heaven. Okay? It represents Christ who died, whose body saw no corruption, and was raised on that Sunday morning. And Mary went to him and she said, Rabbi. And he said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Now we read these texts in Matthew. And I, here's what I want you to, to realize. The graves were opened on Friday, which means that the first fruits were marked. You with me? They rested in those graves, as did Christ, on the Sabbath day 
unleavened bread. And then they rose on the first day with him, okay, and were seen by many as they walked about Jerusalem. Now, Christ ascended to heaven, and in Psalms chapter 24, may come as a surprise to you, this could end up being the sermon today, in Psalms chapter 24, which follows Psalms 22 and Psalms 23, you knew that, you may or may not know this. Psalms 22 is seen, the three, the three psalms there, 22, 23, and 24, are seen as psalms that address Calvary. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see it? 22, 1. The resurrection, Psalms 23, and the ascension in Psalms 24. Now, Psalms 24 is absolutely stunning, and I want you to put it within the context of Christ ascending on that, that first day of the week and taking with him, because ultimately, who is the first fruits? Christ. Paul's very clear. You need to be clear. The interesting thing about the Levitical gospel is we're about to see Christ present himself before the Father as the first fruits, bringing those with him who are also part of that wave sheaf. You know, Jesus is our older brother. He's the firstborn among men. He is, if you will, the barley head amongst barley heads. Okay? You, you see what I'm saying here, right? All right. And so Christ presents himself in heaven as the wave sheaf and as the first fruits, and I have brought these with me. Okay? Now, the question is asked, how do we keep first fruits? Okay? As I approach Christ, who is my Passover, I, I declare my confidence in Christ's blood, his purity, his holiness, his righteousness, not mine. And I make that ad admonition, I, I declare that, and I am thus marked. Okay? And then, because the seed must die before it bears fruit, I step into the baptismal font, having been marked, and then I share in Christ's death, a form of Sabbath, I rest in that watery grave, okay, unleavened bread, and then I am brought up out of that watery grave, and I share, and listen carefully to this, I share in the resurrection power that calls me to newness of life in the same way that I share in the power that will call me out of the grave should I die. There's no difference in the power. Amen. Unless you limit it, brothers and sisters, God forbid, okay? So is everybody clear? You want to keep first fruits? Declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be baptized for the remission of sins and experience the power of the Holy Spirit to transform your life to be like Jesus. Got it? Now, you know, after the first fruits, Jesus returned. And he walked amongst men for 40 days. And then he said, y'all get together. Don't go anywhere until I send the Holy Spirit. Now, those 50 days that elapsed bring us to a, a feast known as the Pentecost. And at that time, Christ, who had ascended that second time, is ordained, if you will, is, is anointed as the high priest. And as the Holy Spirit is poured out upon Christ in the same way, that oil was poured out upon Aaron. It ran off his head and dripped off his beard and it fell I don't know how many miles till it ignited and fell upon the apostolic church on that day in the forms of tongues of fire. Amen? 
And it is that power that led a group of about 120 to see phenomenal growth within the course of the next few days and weeks. Now, the scripture tells us that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that it found the church, all 120 of them, that's the, that's the global Christian church at the time, not a whole lot more than what we see here. Twice the number. That when Pentecost was fully come, that it found the church in one place and in what? One accord. Now, ponder that for just a minute. They were there because there was no place more important to them than to be there. And Christ had told them to be there. And they were of one accord. Ponder that. We're now living in the antitypical day of atonement. It's a fast, not a feast. The heavenly sanctuary is the repository for sin. The only sins that can't be forgiven are the ones that are not confessed. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that at some point in time, there'll be no more confessing of sin, which means that there will either be nobody that wants to confess any more sin, God forbid, or all sins have been confessed and we are wholly given over to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, some folks may find that that idea presents a challenge to them. But before we get into stepping stones and stumbling blocks, let's just be reminded that the last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, and where do we celebrate that? In heaven. Amen? And so, by God's grace, we will all be there. So you want to celebrate the the first fruits, give yourself in baptism and give yourself over to the newness of life and the power of the resurrection which will manifest itself in newness of life as well as when Christ comes and he calls the sleeping saints from their graves. Stepping stones. Or stumbling blocks. Let's pray. Father, I'm going to take this little bit of time and ponder what it means to be of one accord. Lord, ask your Holy Spirit's presence at this time in a mighty way, Lord. May we be found of one accord in this one place. May this repeat itself around the world with your people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a stepping stone, according to Webster, is a stone on which to step. Don't you love it? And then it says, as in crossing a stream. Okay? And then number two, it says, a means of progress or advancement, period. A stepping stone as a means of progress or advancement. Remember, everything needs to be contextualized within the, the greatest of realities, that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that Jesus is coming to take us home. Amen. Now, a stumbling block 
is an impediment to belief or understanding. It creates perplexity. It's an obstacle to progress. So a stepping stone is a means of progress. A stumbling block is an obstacle to progress, okay? Simple enough. Now, doctrines are the teachings of Christ, ideally, amen? Of the Bible, the Word of God. This is our authority. And so as we study the Word of God, and it brings us face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior and myself, okay, it provides us with the answers to life's questions, the means of salvation. Doctrines are teachings. They are the way we live out the love of Christ, okay, in our lives. That's all it really is. And Jesus said, if, if you're my disciples, go and teach, right? And Christ taught, he preached, and he prayed, and he healed, all right? So, what happens is, is that sometimes we run into doctrines that are uncomfortable for us. And I just want to tell you, I preached a sermon on encouragement a month or two ago. And the intention is, is that this sermon is, a, is a, a means and a way of encouragement also. But encouragement should never give license to sin. Amen? All right. So let's, let's, let's step off on a few doctrines and see where we're at on these collectively, okay? Because we are a, what? Family. We're a church, all right? Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, all right? But the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we're told in 1 John that, that uh, if you don't think you've sinned, you're sorely mistaken, you're deceived, and that Christ doesn't actually live in you. So, one, the wages of sin is death. Romans 3, 23 and 24, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus really doesn't care. He's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care whether you're rich, poor, male, or female, whether you've got letters after your name, or you're completely illiterate. doesn't care. He cares about your heart and you, and he wants to spend eternity with you. And whatever deficiencies I might have, whether it's in character, let's just go there, Whatever deficiencies I have, Christ wants to address them, make, it, make things up for me. You understand what I'm trying to say there? That was rough. He will address my deficiencies, and he will close the gap, and he will grow me. All right? He will gift me, and he will save me for eternity. And then this ignorant man gets to spend eternity studying the science of salvation from God himself. And let me tell you, whatever deficiencies you think you have, when you meet God face to face, you'll re realize that you were wrong in thinking you have them. They are, in fact, a reality. Okay? And you don't have to wait. You can, you can come to that realization now. But the good news is, is if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Sanctuary, if I confess my sins in the courtyard, okay, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I apply his blood in the, in the holy place. I feed on his body. I drink the wine. The Holy Spirit illuminates the word of God. His body is there on that table, all right, that he prepares in the presence of mine enemies. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what's that last little bit? To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, there will be another sermon later on, but you are called to a most holy place, worship. This is the church of the most holy place. It's a timeline, if you will. 
and his sheep know his voice, and they follow him whithersoever he goeth. Okay? And that is into the presence of the Shekinah, where the law of God is enshrined in the mercy seat, the throne of mercy. Okay? And cleansing takes place. Jesus is assuredly cleansing your heart and the person next to you as he is the sanctuary in heaven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, so far, I think we're in agreement. I've kind of put some stuff out there that not everybody's going to be familiar with, but if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you certainly should be. And if you're a Bible student, you can be. Here's something we all agree on. There's no other name under heaven by which... Amen. See? We're in, we're in one accord on this point, aren't we? No one approaches the Father but through me, he says. Can I hear an amen? amen. We're in one accord. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. This is an incredible passage and one that we just really need to... Uh, ponder more regularly Colossians 1 16 and 17 for by him that is Jesus Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all how much all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things, KJV, consist. drawn everything in the universe to himself. He is the center. Any theology that diminishes the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and his perfect life, his atoning blood, is a false religion. Flee from it. Mercy. So far we're doing pretty good. We're of one accord. Now, Isaiah 5.20 gives us a warning. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That is a contemporary Bible text, brothers and sisters. You are living in that day and age. Whew. Part of the problem is, is that it rubs off on us. Okay? So it's a good time to bring Esther up. Here's a young woman. Jewish descent, living in the Persian Empire. A lot of folks, when Ezra and Nehemiah went back during the Babylonian captivity and the king of the Medes said, you can go back. Ezra and Nehemiah, rebuilding of the temple, right? Some folks didn't go. Babylon was pretty comfortable. Esther grew up in that. Now, in the end, she recognized that she was there for what? Such a time as this, and she didn't shirk from her responsibilities. But it's safe to say that if you spend enough time in Babylon or Media or Persia, sooner or later, it might rub off on you just a little bit. And we're inclined to dismiss that because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Brothers and sisters, if you don't like that one, then go to Revelation, what, chapter 3? That we're Laodicean. And that we're, we talk about it. I don't need nothing. I'm doctrinally rich. God's blessing me materially. I've kept all these laws since my childhood. Okay? The problem is, is that Christ 
suggests, no, he, he says, if, if you don't confess these sins, he's going to spit you out of his mouth, make him vomit. So, brothers and sisters, I want to come to you today and suggest that, that we need to be very, very careful as our ranks grow and we enjoy the material blessings of living in the North American division and the pews are filling up, that we be ever mindful that material wealth can be as big a trap as poverty. Even more so. So let's jump off into this. And so that you don't have to take my word for it. Unless our knowledge. Now you may be educated as a nurse. How many nurses we got? Yeah, we got nurses. Got any doctors in the house? <clears throat> we got one, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. You may not know that, but we have a doctor in the house. We've got retired military. We've got successful businessmen. All right? We've got mothers who have the most important job, raising their children for the eternal kingdom. Amen? Amen. So that's pretty rarefied air there, you know. Thanks for letting us in, ladies. All right? Queens. So no matter what it might be, no matter your knowledge, no matter your material possessions in the way of wealth, no matter your strength, no matter how beautiful you are, no matter how disciplined you might be, unless your knowledge okay, and your skills are a stepping stone to the accomplishment of the highest purposes, and that is the glorification of God and the saving of souls to his glory, it's worthless. It's transient. Ministry isn't what you know. It isn't what you say. It isn't what you do. But rather the consistency between those three things in all the elements of your life. That, brothers and sisters, is ministry. Want it one more time? What you say, what you know, and what you do need to be consistent. If they're not, we call it hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is a great stumbling block to an onlooking world, and maybe to the child who's taken up the offering today, or your brother and sister, all right, who accidentally became aware of your secret sin, which isn't a secret anymore. Whew. Yeah, Facebook, man. Whoops, open, yeah, you know, get online and tell everybody how you feel and let them see Jesus in your heart, right? Oh, my. All right. So if it's not working, if it's not a stepping stone to the accomplishment of the highest purpose, it's worthless. This comes to us from Gospel Workers. That came from Testimonies 8, by the way, Volume 8. This comes to us from Gospel Workers under the examination for the ministry, but it applies to us all. Those who claim to keep and teach the holy law of God. Anybody here claim to teach the holy law of God? I think I would like to see everybody. Okay, if not, let's talk. All right? I want to be of one accord on this point. All right? Those who claim to teach, to keep and teach the holy law of God and yet are continually transgressing that law are stumbling blocks both to sinners and to believers in the truth. Okay? All right. Now, we're still of one accord. I didn't ask if you suddenly realized you're not a perfect human being and that you need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We assume that you already knew that. It might become more clear as we progress. Um, you know, we studied in Sabbath school, we studied um, covetousness. Covetousness can be a, a very secret sin, you know. 
It never necessarily has to reveal itself, although if your mind ponders on something long enough, you're likely to act upon it, okay? It, it, it's just we're wired that way. Very dangerous to, to, to look at what you shouldn't look at and to want what you shouldn't want, whether it's a sports car or whatever it may be. Now, we've looked at... Isaiah 5.20, and I want to take a quick look at 2 Timothy 4. We've made reference to Revelation chapter 3. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Second Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall judge thee quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be in, this is Paul's admonishment to Timothy the evangelist, right? If you've laid claim to being a member of God's kingdom, you're at least called to be a disciple, and there's something here for you, okay? Are we in one accord on that point? Yeah. yeah. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, do the work of a disciple, make full proof of your ministry. Woo. Are we still of one accord? So far? so far? Okay. The time is coming when the church of God, and that includes the remnant church, will not endure sound doctrine. A simple thus saith the Lord won't cut it, and the beauty of the spirit of prophecy is, is that, that sometimes we read through the prose and the poetry of the KJV, and we, the fine points, they just kind of miss our hearts. You know what I'm saying? Or my toes. Sister White, she will flat out tell you what your problem is and what you need to do about it. And that rubs some people very, very wrong. Now, that means that, anybody know who, who uh, Chris Hudson is? The truth is the truth, whether you like it or not. Give it in love. Give it with a winsome heart. Give it with a burden for souls. But just because Richard doesn't like this particular counsel doesn't mean it's not the truth. And I can wiggle all day and, you know, I can get creative. You'd think some of us were artists. You know, I can't do this and I won't do that because, all right? But the reality is, brothers and sisters, is that we want to be of one accord. And the devil is in the details of your life. And Jesus wants him out. Because Jesus is holy and he's righteous and he's pure and he cannot live in the presence of sin. Which means that if Richard wants to live in the presence of God, are we all one accord on this point? Then we got to get sin out of our lives. And we can't do that ourselves. It has to be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's not to say you don't need to exercise some discipline and when you recognize sin, you avert your eyes. And for those of us who understand standing in a circle and passing one around, okay, does this look familiar to anybody? Yeah, oh, you know, all things are made new, praise the Lord, okay? But you don't decide to, to not partake of sin by standing in a circle and waiting for sin to get past your way and say, no man, I'm good, you know, and let them pass it right up underneath your nose. You stay out of the circle of sin. And if you know it's gonna be going on there, don't go there. Amen. 
Don't go. Flee from the appearance of sin. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Are we still of one accord? I'm, I'm encouraged, all right? Jeremiah 6, 14 says that there are those who are going to say, peace, peace. And there is no peace. Be careful what you're listening to. Up here at one of these Baptist churches on 5 South, they've got a little brochure I've been told. I don't have one, but I want one. I'm going to go get one. It says, why I'm glad I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. God have mercy. You want to know what I think the response and answer to that brochure is? That our lives are reflective of the everlasting gospel and the benefits of living out the truth as it's been revealed to God's remnant body through increased length of life, through a glow in your face, through well-behaved children. I believe the gospel will brush your teeth. It'll make you skinny. Some of us a little quicker than others. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Gary Isbell, Judge Isbell, had his legs cut off. It could have been, listen, I don't know about you, I don't know how I would have responded to that kind of a stumbling block to the plans I had. Ask yourself. But some of us, evil surmising enters in and so-and-so wasn't nice to me or, or, you know, I mean, there's just, come on. You know, a lot of times the stumbling blocks are because we're backing through life rather than moving forward on the stepping stones. And I prostrate on the ground and I'm not making progress through no fault of my brothers and sisters, but through my own carelessness. What was it? Distractibility. These were my sins this week, at, at least, right? Distractibility. All right. Remember, sharing our joys and we share in one another's burdens. Are we on one accord on that point? All right. Praise the Lord. You know, there are sinners in the ministry, and they are not agonizing to enter at the straight gate. I pray that each one of us is. Because it says that God doesn't work with them. He can't endure the presence of sin. Holiness is the foundation of God's throne, and sin is the opposite of holiness. Sin crucified the Son of God. And if you are to be saints in heaven, you must be saints upon the earth. We in one accord on that? What is a saint? The definition out of Scripture. Does anybody know the definition of a saint is those who have made a sacrificial covenant with God? Who sacrifice? Christ. You don't have to die and have somebody vote you into sainthood. What you have to do is die to self, be buried in his death, and raised to his glory, right? And live that life with resurrection power. And you too are a saint. We got saints in the room today? Amen. Amen. We're one accord. I'm going to throw some names out there just real quick. Biblical examples. Remember that uh, stepping stones can be either situational or they may be personal. They may present themselves in the way of a person. They may, they may be a doctrine. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us into what? All truth. This stepping stone of truth. This stepping stone of truth. This stepping stone of truth. We call those doctrines. When God shows you where the next stepping stone is, what are you going to do? Step. Wait a minute. Or are you going to step forward in faith? Amen. Ruth. A Midianite. A Moabite. Excuse me. Let me get it right. A Moabite. A widow. But... What she saw in the ministry of her mother-in-law 
was a stepping stone. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. I'm going to go meet my responsibilities as they've been ordained. I'm not going to come enmeshed in, oh, woe is me. I'm going to go glean the corners. And I'm going to do a really good job of it. And God's going to bless. And she's listed in the, lineal, the chronology, the lineage of who? Jesus Christ. Amen? You have no idea how many lives you can touch if you'll just take the next step. I don't know where it's going. Well, God does. Esther touched bases already with Esther. Such a time as this. Of course, Jesus is our greatest example. Amen? Born in Nazareth. They talked about him being illegitimate. They were kind of poor. Yeah. Yeah, carpenter's son. Born in a, in a little old cave stable thing, you know, I mean, did, did not go to very good schools. I mean, he was a homeschooler, you know. I mean, so here's Jesus, you know, what's that? Praise the Lord, amen. Praise the Lord for homeschoolers. There's that mother and those queens of the household thing again. Remember, sisters, you, it's the greatest calling there is, all right? Raising the next generation for God's kingdom. Woo! All right. Of course, we know Job's story, right? Job had some major stumbling blocks thrown up in his way. Caleb, he was ready to go in. You know, what Caleb didn't do is go create a new denomination. What he did is he wandered for the next few weeks. 40 years remaining faithful to this idea that these were God's people, warts and all, ministering to the next generation of young people who would do what their parents had never done, cross over, amen, into the promised land. I hope the young people are listening. Alan? <laughs> Are you ready to lead the next generation into eternity? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Joseph. Whew. Joseph. Just about time you think you got this figured out. Boom. You know, this coat, it's a nice coat. It's a lousy pit. Oh, now I got a rope around my neck and I'm headed off with the Ishmaelites. I get sold on the auction block like a horse or a cow, an oxen. Well, those are stumbling blocks. They can be. But what did Joseph do? He takes the stumbling blocks and he turns them into tall stepping stones. Rise above the disappointment. Rise above the chaos. Rise above the hurt feelings. Things got better. Oh, the devil says, man, this Joseph guy, you know, every time we do something, I'll get him. So the devil tries to trap him with success. Unlike Samson, strongest man that ever lived, who was held captive by the caress of a woman, Joseph said, I can't sin against God, and I have a responsibility to Mr. Potiphar. Right? He flees from sin. Whoop. Well, back to the dungeon, another pit. So what does Joseph do with this stumbling block? He converts it into a stepping stone. And he works hard. You know, I just want to tell you, not only do we live in an age when good is called evil and evil is called good, if you show up for work, and you do it on time for three weeks, there are some organizations, you've heard this said, will make you the manager of that business. Joseph showed up early and he worked hard under terrible circumstances. And it ends up being to God's glory. And then he gets forgotten. 
And he continues to work, and he gets forgotten again, and then one day he gets remembered. And the next thing you know, there's this mighty kingdom leaving Egypt, and they've got Joseph's bones with them, right? And we're talking about him today. How about those who were given remarkable advantage in life? Eli's sons. Samuel's sons. King Saul. Sometimes the stepping stones of success and spiritual growth become stumbling blocks to us. Selfishness steps in. Our imaginations wander. We get comfortable. Babylon rubs off on us. We forget that this denomination is incredibly wealthy doctrinally and called to a special work. And we're not talking about status here. Jesus died for Everyone, are we of one accord on this idea? Christ, it's about role. Fair enough? Role. It's about role. See, your role is a little different than anybody else's in the world because you have taken on the mantle of the three angels and the everlasting gospel, which means that you're going to tell everybody that they're about to go off the edge of a cliff and you don't want them to, and not everybody's going to respond favorably. Sometimes that distinctiveness of the church of the remnant is a stumbling block to some folks. It smacks of elitism. It's misunderstood if that's the case. There are numerous compelling stories in Scripture and, con- and as well as contemporary Helen Keller. Think about our, um, the lady that wrote the hymns. She's blind. Fanny Crosby, Fanny Crosby thank you. We also have, even in this room, people who have challenges but have provided leadership to a hearing world. Amen? Rather than throwing up excuses. Any of you know Scott Michael Bennett and the terrible accident that fell on him recently in a car accident? Everything he has done in his healing process has been public and to God's glory. Shelly Powell, who lives down in Amity, is dying a very slow, slow death. Most people would consider it a stumbling block. She continues to live her her life to God's glory and praises him every day. Let's be mindful of what constitutes real success. If all your knowledge is not being applied, if all your skills are not being applied, to the saving of souls. If you're turning away from the next stepping stone and it has become a stumbling block to you, God can help you overcome that. And if you acknowledge it, nobody in this room is going to love you less. Are we on one accord in that? Brothers and sisters, we all, how many think Jesus is coming soon? And, and, oh, yeah. and, and so ponder that idea. What does that mean we start to look like congregationally as a church family? What's that look like? As we ponder the stepping stones that are placed before us, the advantages, the, the doctrines, the advantages, the stepping stones, let's be certain that Hypocrisy is a stumbling block. And how we respond to the stepping stones may create a stumbling block for others, determines to a large degree whether or not the onlooker 
or th- or Richard as he reacts to that stepping stone, whether I become a stumbling block or a stepping stone for others. You understand what I just said? Let me say it again. How I respond to truth has a significant bearing on the onlooker. I got a little thing here somebody gave me once. I like it. I don't have a source and I don't have a text and a verse, but I like it. It says, a rabbi once told me that faith is the realization on looking at what seems only strewn before us. A pile of rubble, stumbling blocks, strewn before us. That on looking at what seems only strewn before us, that it has instead been set before us. It's no accident. God knows. He's perfecting your character. The refiner's fire, amen? These challenges don't block your way. They are your way. Overcoming is to God's glory. It's not legalism. Obedience is an appropriate response to grace always. We're going to close. One last little thing here. Little, little something here I ran across. Thought it was timely. It's called maturity. Spiritual maturity. You know, the next generation... I think has a reasonable right to expect some spiritual maturity in those of us who are adults and have been Christians for a while. Maturity is the ability to do a job whether you are supervised or not. Maturity is the ability to finish a job once it is started. It's the ability to carry money without spending it. Maturity is the ability to bear an injustice without wanting to get even. Maturity is the ability to control anger and settle differences without violence. Maturity is patience. It is the willingness to postpone immediate gratification in favor of the long-term gain. Maturity is perseverance. It's the ability to sweat out a project or a situation in spite of heavy opposition and discouraging setbacks. Maturity is the capacity to face unpleasantness and frustration, discomfort and defeat without complaint or collapse. I point to Joseph. Maturity is humility. It is being big enough to say, I was wrong. Are we on one accord on that? Yeah. Amen. And we're not going to love each other any less. Amen. Because brothers and sisters, they had 50 days to get in one accord in one place because the Holy Spirit was about to fall, the former rain. If we can, if we can get this, if we can get each of our hearts right. And that's where cleanse, you know, we talked about Achan today. I, I interrupted this. Let me finish this. And hopefully I'll come back to this thought. All right. Maturity is humility. It is being big enough to say I was wrong. And when right, the mature person needs not experience the satisfaction of saying, I told you so. Maturity is the ability to make a decision and stand by it. The immature spend their lives exploring possibilities, then they do nothing. Maturity means dependability, keeping one's word, coming through in a crisis. The immature are masters of the alibi. They are confused and disorganized. Their lives are in a maze of broken promises, former friends, unfinished business, and good intentions that somehow never materialized. Maturity is the art of living in peace with that which cannot change, which we cannot change, the courage to change that which can be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference, all, by the way, which come through the power of the Holy Spirit. You ain't going to know what to do, when to do it, or how to do it without the leading of the Holy Spirit. Maturity sounds an awful lot like love. 
But isn't that the way it should be? As we grow in Christ, our love for one another will grow. If we're going to find ourselves in one accord, we're going to have to make sure that we step solidly on the stepping stones that might look like stumbling blocks to us and give each other a hand. When you experience victory in your life, you are modeling a life that others can be encouraged by. Amen? So often, criticism and pointing fingers and evil surmising are the stumbling blocks that trip us up. And let us be mindful, it is a sin in any church not to search for the cause of the darkness that may manifest itself and of the afflictions which have been in the midst of us. A truly prosperous church and a healthy family, and that is what we are, will seek out the disease or the danger in its midst and facilitate healing. Amen? The truth spoken in love. It's how we achieve a prosperous family. It's how a prosperous church will develop as well. But I want to tell you, before we ex can expect a victorious and healthy family, we must search first search out the own sin in our hearts, or the sin in our own hearts, confess it, be cleansed, and rejoice in the resurrection power, amen? find ourselves on that sea of glass that we all want to be to be there right so there's there's that one accord Whew. stepping stones or stumbling blocks your day will be filled with them don't be a stumbling block and don't be afraid of taking the next step let's stand we're going to sing a closing hymn 609, Linda says, stepping stone or stone, uh, am I a soldier of the cross? We're going to be happy when Clancy can come back up here, aren't we? 609. Soldier of the cross of Glory 
shall be thine. Heavenly Father, great is thy faithfulness, abundant are thy mercies. Lord, glorious and holy is thy law. Lord, write it on our hearts. Lord, the law of love and the law of liberty. May we be gracious towards one another as you have been gracious to us. Ever mindful, Lord, that whether we like it or not, and we pray, Lord, that we would love it. The truth is the truth. See us through the remaining hours of this holy Sabbath day. We pray, Lord, we would be a stepping stone of grace and not a stumbling block to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.